You're listening to the Jewel City Podcast. You can join us in person Sundays at 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. We have something for all people and all ages. Or join our live stream at 10 a.m. In this podcast, we'll hear a message from our congressional care pastor, Aaron Caton. Today, tonight, we're going to talk about the Davidic covenant. The Lord laid um, 2 Samuel chapter 7 on my heart, and it's been on my heart, and uh, I hope that I do him good. Um, I could read the whole chapter to you, and, and I think it, I think just reading the whole chapter would move you, to be honest. Um, but I want to talk about David tonight. Uh, David was a man after God's own heart, is how God labeled him, right? So 1 Samuel 13 and 14, Samuel is talking to Saul, and it reads, But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Saul was king, but he had not followed the commandments that God had given him. And God, God had given commandments that, that weren't anything hard. Saul disobeyed him. He went and sacrificed without Samuel, and that, that hurt God. He, God instructed him to kill the, Amal- the Malachites and all their animals, and he didn't do that. Saul disobeyed him. And because of that disobedience, that disobedience, because of that failure, God was through with Saul and he rejected him. Listen, the commandments that God has given us, whenever we think about this Davidic covenant, I want you to understand, it started with Saul being disobedient. That's how David became anointed. And that's how he moved. You've been drawn out by Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit. You've been drawn out and God has given us commandments to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. To love others. This is the commandments. And we got to live on those commandments. First Samuel 16 and 7, it says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. The Lord sent Samuel to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. And he, and he goes to Jesse and he says, hey, the Lord has sent me and, and I'm to look over your sons and I believe that the Lord is going to pick one of your sons to be the next king. So Samuel calls his seven sons and one by one they come before, or Jesse calls and he sends them before, before Samuel one by one. And they're all lined up and the Lord has not moved. The Lord has not spoken to Samuel on who is to be king. Each one of them is fine in their countenance. Each one of them is beefy. They're balked up. They're they're military status. They're ready to do anything. But it's not who God has chosen. I can only imagine how awkward Samuel must have felt. He's standing there looking at seven grown men and a dad going, well, which one is it? Which one is it? But the Lord had not spoken. And Samuel says unto Jesse, he says, do you have another one? Is there any more children left? He goes, yeah, there's one more. And Samuel says, fetch him and bring him here. In 1 Samuel 16, verses 12 and 13, and he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, means he was reddish. He had, a, he had a, a skin tone of red, whether it was from the sun of working, whether it was from running from the field to get to the house, he had this reddish glow about him. And a withal of beautiful countenance and goodly to look at. And the Lord said unto Samuel, arise, anoint him. For he is, for he is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of the oil, anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. David was just a teenager when he was anointed king of Israel. He came and he faced and he slayed Goliath. He was banished by Saul. He hid in the desert places. He ran for his life because Saul sought to kill him because he knew the anointing was up on him. It was nearly 15 years between being anointed king and when he actually became king. His faithfulness was tested time and time again, but he continued to be faithful unto God. And because of that testing, God was continued to convert him from shepherd to warrior to warrior to king. 
God is still in the converting business today. He brings us from sinners to saints. He still is moving upon us. Even though we're tough and we're rough and we're rowdy, whatever it is, he's still moving us. You can't change me and I can't change you, but the Holy Spirit is the one that changes us just like the Holy Spirit changed David. Amen? He's still moving on us. Look, he took David, a small shepherd boy, and made him a mighty man of valor. And then he made him a, a man over mighty men of valor. And David and his men, they fought many battles. That's the nature that God can take us and just move us to where he wants us to go. Amen? And listen, and the calling is going to come up on your life. Whether or not you believe it or not, the calling will be on your life. And when it comes, your heart needs to be right with God. And it needs to stay right. And you need to stay faithful to God. Keep your faith in God. He doesn't change. His plans don't change. His thoughts don't change. He has a plan and a hope to prosper you, to protect you, and to keep you, right? His way of training us, it may not be the way that we think it ought to go. You just never know how he's going to train you up. You know, I can think about the mentors that I prayed for and the ones that God brought into my life, and I would have never thought about those men. Didn't even know them. Had no clue. But that's what God can do for each and every one of us. He can bring people into our lives, but we have to stay faithful and we have to seek him as David did. Hebrews 11 and six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. What is our faith in? Our faith is in Jesus Christ, that he was born of a virgin, that he died and rose again, and that he ascended into heaven. Our faith is in Jesus. David's faith was in God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God is your rewarder. He's a good, good father. It may take time, but he's counting your faithfulness as righteousness. Every time David moved for God in obedience, it was his faithfulness into righteousness. So keep seeking the Lord as David did. He's moving for your good. You may not know it. When David was running for his life and hiding in caves, he couldn't see God doing what he wanted to do. But God was still protecting him and God was still moving for his good. So keep moving. David becomes king and he seeks to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. For 20 years, the Ark has rested in Kirjath Jerem at Abinadad's house. Abinadad was a Levite. The Philistines had, had captured it. And, and after all the things that the Lord had done to him, they finally sent it back on a cart. They said, I, we can't deal with this in, in our nation anymore. So they sent it back. And it rests at Abinadad's house. Second Samuel chapter six, verse three. And they set the ark, of, the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Giab. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. So the ark is setting up on a cart just as it was brought to them. King David says, well, if it was brought that way, let's build a new one. Let's put the ark on it and let's bring it back. So they're moving it. And David in the house of Israel, they're happy. They're singing. They're dancing. They're praising God. They're playing music, thinking that it's all pleasing God because it's coming back to Jerusalem. But verse six, we see, and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen shook it. The oxen shook the cart. He put his hand up there in verse seven and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God smote him there for his error. And there he died for the ark of God. There he died by the ark of God. I'm thankful that we live by the grace of Jesus. I'm thankful that we don't, that we don't get judged by our errors just as Uzzah did because not one of us would be standing here today or sitting here. God was not pleased with the way that they were transporting the Ark of the Covenant. He wasn't pleased with how the people were doing it. And David recognizes the anger of the Lord. David leaves the, leaves the Ark at Obed-Edom's house. David's afraid of God. And now he seeks counsel on how to move the Ark of the Lord. I'm going to say that David not only learned the proper way to move the Ark of the Covenant, but also the pattern of the tabernacle. We start with the bronze altar. God required the people to offer a sacrifice for their sins. God allowed the blood of an animal to atone, to make a way, to take away the sins of the people, making it possible for the worshipers to enter into God's presence. David learned that sacrifice was the way to, to enter into our house. God was, David was learning that sacrifice was the only way that the worshipers would be accepted and God would allow them 
when we sacrifice, when we come through the house, uh, uh, the, the doors here, man, we should have our sacrifice ready. We should, uh, and, and I'm not beating anybody up and don't take it the wrong way, but our tithe and our offering, man, it's right there at the door. You walk in with, with a thankful heart. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me, man. And you're just ready. That's your sacrifice. That's your heart. Just being ready and prepared for God. You're just saying, Lord, here I am. I'm going to give you my sacrifice today. Now my praise is coming. You made your sacrifice. That's what David's learning right here by the bronze altar. He's saying, I can open up my sacrifice. And then it opens up the presence of worship. Amen. It goes from there, the bronze laver. And after the bronze, the, the bronze altar, the rest of these steps were performed by the priest on behalf of the people. But David took it to heart because it was where the priest washed thoroughly to purify themselves. It's a reminder that God doesn't look at the stature. God looks inside the motivation, the intention of our heart. You know, those priests, they're washing their bloods and, and whatever off of their face and their hands and they can look in that water and they can see the reflection just as you and I can see our reflection in the mirror every morning before we put on gobs of makeup or whatever. We see the nature and the beauty of who we are. But God looks at our heart. And that was a reminder. David's learning the process. The holy place and everything inside of it was a, was a place where the priest would enter to serve the Lord. And the next was the veil. It was the divider in the holy place, in the most holy place. It divided the holies of holies. It was the barrier between God and men. Remember when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn. So you're able to enter into the holies of holies. Only the high priest could enter the most holy place. The high priest would enter the most holy place once a year, the day of atonement. The focus was on the Ark of the Covenant at that time because that is where God sit and rested. The high priest would enter and he would sprinkle blood upon the mercy seat for his sins and for the sins of the people. The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God, it's the main focus of the entire tabernacle. Tabernacle. It's where God would speak and meet. God was resting between the wings of the cherubims where the blood would be sprinkled upon the mercy seat. It's where wrath against the people became grace and mercy because of the blood of the Lamb. David learned that not only the Levites were the ones to remove the tabernacle, and to move the ark. But he also learned with their services. He learned their clothing. He learned everything that he could about moving the ark of the covenant. And now he's ready to bring the ark back to Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 6 and 12. And it was told King David, saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And we all know he went six paces and he would sacrifice. They would go six paces, they would sacrifice and they would worship. David would dance before him. Everybody would be in the presence of God, worshiping, shouting, praising God, moving. And God was satisfied with how it was moving because it was done right because he went and he learned wisdom that the Levites had to bring up the ark. Verse 17, and they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Think about that. He danced before it, he sacrificed before it, but the very most important thing that he did, he went and he learned that he had to build a tabernacle in order to put the ark of the covenant. He learned the value of where God had to be. He learned that, that, that the tabernacle was the place where God had to be. He didn't just learn how to move the ark, but he established where God had to be. And David burned offerings and sacrifices, peace sacrifices unto the Lord, and it was pleasing to God. Now this takes us into 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic covenant, verses one through three. And it came to pass when the king said in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all of his enemies. Think about it. When we take the Ark of the Covenant into our house, when we take God home with us, he'll give us rest from our enemies if our heart and our motivation of the heart is right with him. Amen? Verse 2 
that the king said unto Nathan, the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with you. David has a, has a desire, a heart to build a tabernacle, a heart to build a temple made of wood for God. He says, how is it that I can live in a house built of wood, but my God is in nothing but curtains? God's never asked for anything else, right? God never asked for a temple. He's never asked for a building. God has walked with his people for 540 years in the tent and was happy. But this man, is after God's own heart. God tells Nathan to remind David, God brought you from the pasture, from chasing the sheep. Nathan reminds him, the Lord did this so that you could be ruler over Israel and all my people. He will appoint a place for his people. The Lord says he will not move them and the wickedness will afflict them no more. The Lord also wants to tell you, David, that he will make thee a house. These benefits, there there are benefits to be in love with God. The house will be established. Your house will be established. David's house is being established. Verse 12, and when the days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of the boughs and I will establish his kingdom. How much does our faithfulness matter? How much did David's faithfulness matter? Listen, whenever I was reading this, it got all over me. When we're dead and gone, God is still setting up your seed. Man, I started thinking about my dad. In Gasway, West Virginia, a small church with seven to 10 people. But he was faithful. I was sin. I was lost in the world as lost could be. And I read that and I'm thinking, wow, what a promise that my dad hasn't seen. He hasn't seen my kid brother. He hasn't seen me. He hasn't seen my sister who's turned faithful unto God because God drew us out of the darkness into into the marvelous light. God hasn't seen that. You may never see, but your faithfulness to God matters. The faithfulness to David, the faithfulness of, of wanting to just establish that ark into a temple mattered unto God. We'll never know what it's going to do for us. Listen, that that territory that I grew up in is Clay County, West Virginia. We're an hour and a half away. We don't know the place that God's going to put your child, my child, our grandchildren. We don't know, but our faithfulness matters unto God. Listen, I'm an hour and a half away. I don't even know. Almost 100 miles away from where I grew up. 80 miles away from where my daddy grew a church. Faithful. I never even heard of Enterprise West Virginia, Shinston, until the kids started playing Pop Warner. Never heard about it. But God extended the territory he had just set aside for me, for you. He's going to move your territory. He's going to bless your seed if you're faithful unto God. All you have to do is keep growing faithful. Keep desiring God's presence in your house, in your heart. She's from Rome County, West Virginia. You can't even get to Rome County. You, you gotta be, you have to intentionally go to Rome County. Like it, it's, you gotta go. There ain't a road that just drove by. I mean, you can drive by Clay County, but think about that. Think about that. Her territory, God moved her from Rome County to Shinston, West Virginia because of the seed of her parents and her grandparents, because of their ability to goss, to praise the Lord. Think about it. There's two testimonies right here from different territories. We're not hometown people. It's where God planted us because of the faithfulness of our parents and our grandparents. Your faithfulness, you never know where your child's going to go. But your faithfulness matters because God will carry the seed to where he wants it to go. Amen? Take Take a safety pin or whatever and put on a map. Just think about it. He tells him in verse 13, he, and he shall, build, he shall build a house for my name and I shall establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That promise from God to David was through Solomon. Solomon built the temple. David didn't do it, but Solomon did. Verse 14, I will be his father and he shall be my son. There it is, the eternal promise to David, amen? Verse 16, 
and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Your heart for God matters. Your love for God matters. You see David's love, you feel his heart right there. He's saying, I can't stand living in this house while you live in a tent, Lord God. All of who you are for God will affect your future generations. All of who you are. You might think that your prayers don't matter, but they matter. My daddy's prayers, my daddy, whenever I would show up, he would open up his Bible and he said, let me read this to you. And he'd read me a verse and I didn't even understand what he was reading and he didn't even explain it to me and it didn't matter to me. But his faithfulness to God, I'm going to keep sowing a seed. I'm going to keep reading this scripture to my son. I know, that, I know where he's at. I know how lost he is. I know that he's a prodigal, but I'm going to keep opening up this Bible and reading a verse because I know that you're going to establish my house, God. That's what it does. That's what the Lord is doing. Don't put God on the outside of your heart. You need him all the way inside. In order to be changed, in order for your nature to be changed, in order to get rid of the past world that we dwell on sometimes, it's because we got God locked on the outside. If we let him fully in, freedom, freedom, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is liberty. You don't have to hold on to that thing. If there's guilt inside of you today, you got to let it go. You got to say, Lord God, move into my heart all the way and live here because I want to walk in that freedom. I want to walk in that liberty. Jesus died so we could have that liberty, that freedom. And it all came through David. Amen. Let him all the way in. Let him establish you. Let him establish your family. After hearing what the Lord, had, the Lord had said, I love this in verse 18. Then went David, King David in and sat before the Lord. Man, he just sat down. And he said, who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that has brought me hitherto? Think about it. Tonight when you go home, just sit down. Who am I, Lord God? Who am I? David says, who am I? How many times have you said that? How many times have you ever questioned the Lord, who am I that you would use me? Your heart has to be ready and open so the Lord can use you because he wants to use each and every one of us that's why Jesus died on the cross and, and ascended into heaven. He says, I'm going to give you the helper and the comforter because you're going to reach more people. I'm one man with 12 disciples. I had 120, but some of them left because they got scared after I got crucified. I don't know what the problem was, right? But we believe in Jesus Christ and he wants to use us. And it's all through love. The greatest commandment that he gave us is love. My shut-in Fred Boring. For three years, there was a grouchy old man that would come and help Freddie. He would, he would go shopping for Freddie. He would come and take out Freddie's trash. And we'd sit down on the couch, and he never wanted to hear about Jesus. Grouchy old Johnny never wanted to hear about Jesus. Freddie passed away. And I told Johnny, I said, I'll come visit you. You ain't got to visit me. I said, man, I'm going to come visit you. And Johnny's old, and he's got problems. I mean, he's... Barely talks. A couple months ago, Johnny slid out of his chair, his recliner on a Saturday night. He was crying out to the Lord. They heard him in the morning and took him to Ruby. Grouchy old man. Showed up at Ruby. Tears come rolling down his eyes. What are you doing here? Johnny, I told you I love you and I would visit you. He moved to, to Genesis in rehab. Went and visited him, standing there in the room by myself. He's down the hall getting physical therapy. Physical therapist walks him in, carrying him on a belt. He goes, oh, you looks like you got a visitor. He says, yeah, it's the preacher. He's got a great big smile across his face, right? But guess what happened on that day? My heart was right with God. Now his heart is right with God, amen? We have to have a heart that's chasing after God in order for God to use us. If our heart's not chasing after God, we're just going to be pew sitters. And that's not what God's called us to be. He says, seek me. I reward those who diligently seek me. How does he reward you? He helps you talk to somebody about Jesus. And then they say, I want to say that prayer. 
It's God. God, who am I that you would allow me to see your glory, Lord God? What do you mean? I saw somebody say the sinner's prayer. Who am I that you would allow me to see the glory? Hmm? It's not just about all the blessings that he pours out. The love that he talked about this morning, the unselfishness of putting others before us, that's the love of Christ. That's just pouring out. Hmm. Listen, the humility is overwhelming experience at times. This promise is forever. To David, a kingdom forever. It humbled him and he sat down and he thanked the Lord. Verse 22, he says, Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God. Man, sometimes before we start saying, Almighty God, or however we pray, Father, maybe we should open up our mouths and just say, Thou art great, O Lord God. For there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Man, your faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. In order to keep your house right, we got to open the word and we got to allow it to come in. David said, according to all that we've heard with our ears. Man, according to what he's heard, he is believing that God is going to establish his kingdom forever. I'm believing through what I'm reading today because of what, I, what he dropped in my spirit about my dad. Whew. Our generations are going to live forever. Dino, you know, even though he's struggling, we'll keep loving on him and we'll keep sowing the seed. God's got the promise, not us, right? David believes everything, everything that he's hearing. In closing tonight, David continues to be thankful in his praise and his prayer. Verse 28 and 29, and now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words be true, and thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it, and with thy blessings let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. What a covenant, a forever covenant. Think about this. O son of David, have mercy on me. Luke 18 and 38. The blind man is there. O son of David, have mercy on me. And it all started with the Davidic covenant. God held his promise. The Davidic covenant still lives today. O son of David, have mercy on me. We were blind but now we see, amen? God stepped in, his son stepped in, healed us and made us whole. A seed through David, Christ became our high priest. A tabernacle not made by hands. He became the sacrifice that obtained eternal redemption for you and for me. Christ Jesus, he conquered hell, death and the grave. And we always think about that, but while he was doing that, once he did it, he ascended into heaven. And he took some of that blood that was out without spot or blemish and he sprinkled up on the mercy seat and said, Father, these are your children. And he called us in one by one, spirit touching our heart. Amen. All we have to do is keep praising. The covenant still remains, Romans 10 and 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. God loves you. Love God with all your heart. Honor his commandments. And watch him open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you can't contain and that you can't control. Lavish your love on him. Lavish your love on him. This morning we were lavishing our love all over him. In worship, man, we were just pouring out. And you could just feel it. Before you got here, Worship, pre-worship, whatever you want to call it, rehearsal. Man, they were pouring their heart out. And you could feel and you could smell the sweet presence of God. It's not just here. You can have it at your house. But it comes with a song. It comes with a sacrifice. Because you got to be the one that turns on the music. And then you got to be the one that opens your mouth. And then you got to be the one that gets goofy and gets a little radical and lifts a hand and starts dancing or whatever else. Tonight in worship, I thought Cindy should have grabbed my coattail because I opened up my eyes and I was almost shoulder to shoulder with pastor because I was lost in loving on Lord. 
Amen. He loves you. He loves you. Pour it out on him. Chase after him. Just as David chased after him. Chase after him because he loves you. He gave it all. Amen. Amen. I hope that helped you. I said, help me. That's all I got for you. Tonight, if you'll bow your head and close your eyes. I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you're at in your relationship with God. But what I can tell you is that God loves you. What I can tell you is that he wants to establish your kingdom. And if your heart ain't right with God tonight, and listen, brothers and sisters, I'm talking to you Christians. If your heart is not right with God tonight, this altar's open. And I just encourage you to come. If there's one here tonight that's never asked Jesus into your heart, I'd ask you to raise a hand and say, Pastor, I want to believe in Jesus Christ. Today, I want to accept him as my Lord and Savior. Is there one? Is there one? As Pastor Kerry begins to sing, I would just ask you to stand and pour out your love upon him. Pour out your love upon God. Remember what he's done for you. Remember where he's brought you from. Be thankful. Just open up your mouth and tell him how thankful you are for what he's done for you. Thank you for listening to the Jewel City Podcast. You can join us in person Sundays at 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. We have something for all people and all ages. Or join our live stream at 10 a.m. 